Hey there, welcome back to STM32 Coding for Everyone. In the previous tutorial, we saw how you can basically build a simple SPI driver with your STM32 microcontroller and tested it by doing a simple loopback test where we connect the MOSI and the MISO pin onto one another. So this simulate a master and slave communication. In this tutorial, we're going to perform a similar task, but this time around, instead of having an SPI driver, driven in poly mode we're going to have a driver that will be in interrupt mode but before we do that let's first quickly recap here on what exactly is an spi protocol all right so imagine you have a microcontroller that need to talk to some sensors right to perform this you can basically use an spi protocol which stands for a serial peripheral interface so this communication language basically allow your STM32, which will play the role of a master here to control multiple devices, actually dictate the terms of the language. So in short here, the SPI protocol basically use four pins, as you can see here, apart from the VDD or VCC, the five volt pin, 3.3 volt pin and the ground. So if you add those two, you basically need six wires to configure your SPI communication so you've got the mossy pin which basically stand for master out slave in this is the wire that send the data out from the the master to the slave as you can see the direction then you've got the second one the return the talk back which is the miso pin that's basically the master in slave out and you guessed it so this one the slave send the data back into the master so basically the master will request data and the slave will return the data. Then you have the all important pin, the clock pin, right? So the clock here is controlled by the master, which basically run the clock to synchronize all the slave connected to it so that they can all talk in a very controlled manner. Then the fourth pin here, chip select or slave select pins. This is the one that the master also control and it decide which slave it wants to talk to, right? So these basically form the four pins plus the power that makes up the SPI communication protocol. But now why use SPI protocol? Because there are other protocol as well out there. Uh, the most famous one is the I2C protocol, right? So the cool thing about the SPI protocol is that it's fast and can receive and send data at the same time. So it's basically a bi-directional communication and very fast so this is very useful for quick and simple applications and for short distance communication so you cannot implement spi for very long distance communication the one thing to keep in mind is that the spi does not have a way of checking whether the communications have actually been completed successfully so it doesn't check for error so bottom line is if you want a quick communication interface between a master controller with a couple of sensors, slave devices connected to it, the SPI is a quick way and it will get your project up and running much faster. Great, now that everyone knows what exactly is an SPI communication, let's now go ahead and move into our second tutorial here and get this SPI driver in interrupt mode going. Okay, so if you look at this display here, we are basically displaying number six here and please subscribe and like. Now, the number six is basically coming for the fact that we're taking data from the TX buffer here and we're transmitting it into the RX buffer uh, via the SPI protocol loop back test. And what I'm doing is basically after the transmission have been completed, I just display uh, the variable in the array on the placeholder number two. So if we look at our array here, we're going to see zero one two so on number two we basically have variable six and once the transmission is completed in our rx buffer number two we also going to have variable six and that's exactly what's displaying there right so i can reset the code right so it goes into a little countdown and it will display number six again but now if i disconnect one of these wire that I'm jumping for the loopback test and restart it again, 
you're going to realize that after that, it's going to display a random number, 15, from the memory, right? So it's no longer 6, right? So I need to place back the jumper wire and reset, and it's going to give me number 6 again. Now, let's uh, pick up the first variable in the TX uh, buffer here, number 2. So that is on location 0 in our array. So let's replace here with 0 right and upload the code again and this is still running in the polling mode right after that completion we then going to display the variable on the location zero into our rx buffer array okay done complete reset right now this time around we now going to display number two right there we go number two that basically show that on the TX buffer here, the first element on placeholder 0 is 2. After transmission via SPI, we now finding it on the RX buffer, also variable 2 is showing. So now let's go ahead and do this with the interrupt, right, driven SPI. So I'm going to open my SPI driver interrupt IOC. Great. Now to convert our SPI driver from polling mode into an interrupt driven SPI driver, we need to change about three parameters. But before we do that, let's first confirm in the clock configuration, the system frequency here is running on 16 megahertz and we've got our APB1 and APB2 buses are also running at 16 megahertz. Now let's go back into the configurations here and locate the connectivity spi so the parameters that need to be changed the first one is a data size so we're going to change it from four bit mode to a eight bit mode so we're basically going to increase the size of our spi data that must be transferred and now because we're now moving from polling mode into an interrupt driven mode let's just try to control the speed a little bit so we're going to decrease the board rate the press scalar right from atl let's go all the way down to 256 that way, our speed changed from 8 megabit per second to about 62.5 kilobits per second. Still fast, but you can decide which frequency you want to test this. The last parameter we need to change, the third one, that will basically be the interrupt. So we need to enable the global interrupt for our SPI peripheral. So this is basically all we need to do here. So let's go ahead and generate the system code here. Great, so code generation completed. We trust the STM32 Cube IDE that it will generate the necessary code for our interrupt driven SPI. So the first thing we're going to do here, we're going to create a variable that will basically set up a flag for us to check for the transmission completion for the SPI. So we're going to call this variable SPI transfer complete. Then we're going to go back into our main function and we're going to convert this function here that do the SPI transmit receive. We're going to change this into the interrupt uh, version of the function just by adding underscore IT. Then we don't need these max delay extra parameters into this function. So we're just going to remove that like that. But now this interrupt uh, driven function here basically will call a callback function. The callback function will be called after the transmission and receive actions have been completed. So what we need to do is then to call that callback function and do something inside the callback function. So what we're going to now do, we're going to come into user code, begin for here. We're going to paste our function that will do the callback here. So we've got SPI, TX RX callback function and it is checking the SPI handle. Now, once the conversion is complete or once the transmission is complete, we want to set the flag variable that we declare here and set equal to zero, right? Somewhere here. And now we're going to set it to be equal to one as soon as the transmission have been completed. So now our flag is now set to one. Now we need to verify inside our code that 
the transmission is complete to basically get something that will tell us that. So to do that, we're going to add another line of code just below the transmission function here. And this code will basically prevent us from going anywhere, right? So basically, so long as this uh, while loop does not exit, we're not going to complete this piece of code here, right? The only time this while loop will evaluate false and exit is when the SPI transfer complete uh, flag is now being set to one. Then we can continue here. So this is basically our checkpoint. And from here, we can now check if all the data have been received from the TX buffer into the RX buffer, basically by running this for loop that goes into the TX buffer and confirm that all the data have been transferred. Okay. And once the data verified that all the data have been transferred, we then going to have this variable success and set it equal to zero. That's a variable we just declare here on line 108. Then what are you going to now do after the variable success is now equal to zero? We can do something with that as well. So I'm going to add another piece of code here that will basically say, well, if success is indeed true, right? Okay. Then we want to display onto our LCD uh, display the pass. But if it's false, we're then going to say, well, fail the transmission basically fail, right? Now, remember the only time this piece of code here is going to evaluate true if all the data from the TX buffer have been sent into the RX buffer. This is very important. Your SPI might, uh, basically the interrupt function here is going to validate true, basically complete and call the callback function here. But this does not guarantee that you've, trans you've transferred all the data from your TX buffer. It does not guarantee that. So remember we said earlier that the SPI uh, protocol does not have a method of checking for errors if all the data have been sent. So you need to find a way to implement that yourself. So that's a bit of what we are basically doing here, right? So if all the data have been transferred, then we can say success, right? That is only after they've already been transferred. So if there is any data missing from the RX buffer here, it's not going to validate true. Then we can basically say, well, fail. Okay. So that's basically all we need here. And to proceed, I'm just going to remove this code here before I build it. So let's just remove all these code. Then we can go ahead and basically build and load this into our STM32 nuclear board. So I'm just going to go ahead and click on run. Okay, project is building and let's hope there are no errors. Great, no errors or warning reported. And we should have our data start loading into the nuclear board here. Okay, welcome to SimTech channel. There we go. So we are actually getting past, so we don't have any uh, error being reported here. Okay, so we can go ahead and change here because remember the zero uh, element here is a placeholder into our array here. Okay, that is displaying number two. Now let's go ahead and take the last one, which is 24 and that basically 11 here. So and replace these parameter here into our RX buffer to 11. Okay, so that should give us the value basically uh, 24 days. So let's go ahead and run it in. Okay, it's loading in. So basically this time around, we should have 24 pass and 24 display onto our LCD display as soon as the data have been validated. There we go, pass and 24. Now to prove that this section is indeed working if all the data are not uh, transmitted, I'm going to go ahead and change the size of the buffer here. Okay, so I'm going to remove size of TX buffer variable and I'm going to replace. We know that the size here is 11. Okay, so I'm going to say 10. So that basically will means we're going to miss the last parameter into the uh, TX buffer there. 
okay let's ensure that we're not using that anywhere so and we're going to also pass here 10 okay then let's run it in so this check here basically will just ensure that we go into a fail because we're not going to be able to display 24 because the size of the buffer is not big enough the size of the rx buffer is not big enough to basically have all the data into the from the tx buffer there you go so we now have fail and zero being displayed because first of all the rx buffer we are trying to look for a variable uh, on a placeholder 11 that does not exist right there is no uh, element in the buffer sitting at location 11 it doesn't exist right and the second thing is does here did not check out it's actually a fail because this section here didn't validate okay but now remember this fail here doesn't mean that your transmission wasn't successful this just mean that not all the data were sent okay were transferred so if we go on here and we change these uh 11 into 5 right so that will basically check that we can get some data in here because remember we could not get all the data because of the size so at the location five we should expect zero one two three four five number 12 so let's go ahead and check that we can get number 12 when we load this code in there we go despite the fact that it is displaying fail we still getting data 12 that is the element at location at the fifth location on our tx buffer right so this here basically just gives you the ability to check the integrity of the data being transferred through your spi protocol now let's go ahead and reverse this so that we can get rid of the fail here so i'm going to go ahead and remove the 10 and put size of uh, tx tx buffer right then i'm going to copy this and it need to be replaced into our transmission function here tx buffer so that basically the size of the buffer that we are running and let's go ahead and run it so that we can see that our function here can then validate to a pass Okay, please subscribe and like this tutorial if you find it useful. There we go. Pass and we're still getting our data 12. And if you want to go ahead and replace here to any number in the element of your array here, you're going to find them, right? Because the transmission have been successful. And remember, when this flag, the callback here is called, and the flag is set you can always do any other thing you want to do blink an led do something you want to do process your data and that is how you can go on with the spi protocol so thank you so much for watching as always make sure you give it a thumbs up and subscribe to simtech channel next uh, tutorial we're going to cover how you can change this interrupt driver into a direct memory access spi driver until next time cheers